All right. Definitely, as people it's migrate water like attendees are a fugitive resource. So as we begin to think through this, hi there. So my name is Roger Fulwardy. I work for NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, and a bunch of other places whenever they're looking for me. So what we're going to deal with here today is a follow-up to the plenary that you saw. But we have an interesting question ahead of you. And I want us all to think about this because this is the speakers will begin. One of my mentors, who I always have to mention at every meeting, his name was Gilbert White, used to ask the question, if we know so much, why aren't we doing better? So I want us to keep this in mind as we think through this, right? If there's science, if there's impacts, if we understand that culture is critical, if we understand all of these things are valuable, why aren't we doing better? So it's a fundamental thing, right? So before we begin to say, hey, well, here's what's missing, I want to also know what it is, how well are we using what we already know? So as we keep that in mind, we'll come from the standpoint of data, uncertainty, climate, economics, practice in different settings, urban and elsewhere, what other kinds of ways of knowing need to be included. But I'll come back to this fundamental question on scaling and on implementation, right? Monitoring and learning and implementation, the usual trail. So just recently we released, I, I was on it, the UN SDG 652 report on transboundary water resources and assessment. We used a lot of Rosario's work, the first sort of uh, map of aquifers put together between Mexico and the US, among other places. And we'll come back to this question because Rosario will remind us, even with the US and Canada, when it comes to aquifers, we do not have strong agreements. And the question is why, right? So here's a quote for you as we begin to think about this. Water has the capacity to unite and act as a driver of peace, sustainable development, climate action, and regional integration. Even in times of severe water scarcity, Cooperation on surface waters and groundwaters has been a game changer and countries have demonstrated an ability to collaborate based on international water law principles in order to find and implement mutually beneficial solutions. A good aspiration. Every bit of that has empirical data and facts behind it. And so I'll come back to this fundamental question. Why have institutional partnerships stagnated? over time, and then what does climate, a changing climate, not just climate change, what does a changing climate introduce into that setting? And how do we address it? That being the fundamental part of the discussion. So we have for you today, Dave Wagner, an old friend and colleague, worked for years ago. We started working together when he was in charge of the adaptive management program on the Colorado Basin. And a whole host of other worked on the Hill, the Water and Science Board here, and is one of the global experts in terms of science and policy. And another one just entered the room. We're going to talk about institutions and one sitting down right there by the name of Erin Salzberg. <laughs> Nisha Pryor from the State Department, Senior Water Advisor, the International Environment and Scientific Affairs, including oceans. Jia Li, the Senior Economist, the World Bank Group, uh, Climate Change Group been at EPA, CEQ, and elsewhere. Dave Feldman, a professor, University of California, Irvine, School of Social Ecology. I'm going to hear as we discuss a few things on not just scaling up, but what does it mean to bring other dimensions, such as art, into how we create partnerships and what that means in the urban setting. And then we'll come back to one of the panelists who was on the earlier plenary. Um, we are, as I like to say, She's be, being plenarized again. Rosaria Flores. Rosaria, as I just mentioned, did the first mapping of groundwater. Doesn't sound crazy after all these years between the US and Mexico, the first comprehensive map between the two countries as a senior research scientist at AgriLife and uh, the Texas Water Resources Institute and works on aquifers. So we're gonna hear a little bit of the dimensions, the challenges, you've heard a lot of, and we're gonna start by asking if we are to adapt in a changing environment, what does it take to do that? What are we already learning? As I like to tell my friends in hydrology, rediscovering that climate is non-stationary is like rediscovering the importance of unsliced bread. It has never been stationary. The statistics by which we're assuming planning is what stationary. So, it holds huge potential, as I just mentioned, we released just recently in the last week or so, 
the UN report that I was involved in on SDG 652. And anybody can tell me we had the U first UN water meeting in a long time last year on water, the UN water summit. Besides Aaron, when was the last time the UN system had a water summit? It was 50 years ago. So we want to not speak here in terms of how does climate change address water, but how do we get more attention within the climate change community for the issues of water, especially transboundary water. It is in fact a water planet, not a CO2 planet. And you're hearing that from somebody who served on IPCC and other things like that, right? The operational arrangements and joint bodies, river-based organizations, Aaron is an expert, both, both Wolf and Salzburg are experts on those arrangements. And here we also have some experts on valuing water for sustainability. It requires measurement, the, what we value, and modes of governance that includes structures of governance, networks and arrangements, and decision-making. So we're trying to move beyond the identification of the salience of the need for transboundary arrangements. And we know that most of the world does not have transboundary arrangements and governance, and we could tell you the percentage. And so what I'm gonna ask the speakers to do is spend anywhere from four to five minutes, just saying one more thing about yourself if you'd like, and then what some of the critical issues are from your perspective. As everyone in this room and as this crowd knows, nobody is tied to his or her discipline. None of us has navigated a path that is simply tied to what we were trained to do. And so it's an open course to bring to bear the knowledge you've accumulated over time. So I'm gonna ask a framing question, but you don't have to respond to the framing question just directly, just say what you think. I've asked Dave Wagner to address the issue of adaptive management. What is it? How adaptive is it in a changing world? And what might we need? Dr. Wagner. Thank you, Roger, for that kind introduction. Um, as Roger said, my name is Dave Wagner. I work part-time for Wolpert Engineering. And the other part of my time, I work with other federal agencies, et cetera, on the issue of policy and water and now expanding into the role that climate change is having on policy and water. And Roger has asked me a bit to frame the question of how do we use science in terms of making management decisions. Um, part of this, what I'm gonna to speak to, comes from my most recent experience of working as a staff director up on the Hill here in Washington, D.C. For, for the House of Representatives for the Water and Power Subcommittee where I dealt specifically with looking at water governance institutions, river basin commissions, the St. Lawrence uh, Seaway Commission, a variety of other entities going on in the Colorado River Basin, along the border, the Great Lakes, et cetera. So I come at this, I, I play in this field that exists between policy and science. So I'm confused most of the time, as Roger will attest to, but I find it's extremely fascinating in how we have developed institutions to actually use information, science, that's collected by a multitude of federal, state, academic, and private entities. How do we use that information to make better decisions? Um, I would contend that many of the water crises we see, especially transboundary conditions around the globe, are actually governance crises, where we don't have the appropriate entities pulled together to consistently serve as a forum for making decisions. There are some shining examples where it does work. I would contend that the, the work on the Colorado River Basin is one. I would contend the International Joint Commission for the Great Lakes is another. The Columbia River with the, the fact that they just come to an agreement last week on July 11th is another example. So there are some places we can see what works and what's consistent about them is they have four elements that they bring together. One, they have good governance. So they have authority to do what they're doing. Somebody has written down either in a piece of legislation or in a court decree that you will do this. So there's a reason for people to be at the table. The second is that the agencies involved, whether they're the federal agencies or the state agencies or tribes, have policies that they are implementing that allow them to actually do something with the information that's being collected. The third leg of that stool is science. Almost every one of those organizations that I mentioned has a program that's collecting science 
evaluating that science and using that science either in modeling or an analysis or some forum so that they they are they are consistent in using data. They're not making it up as they go. And then lastly, they all have a structured decision process. Some forum that sits down and actually uses the science, uses the direction that the policies give them and what the governance is requiring of them to actually come to some solution. Historically, adaptive management was addressed and developed to, de to do that, bring those entities together. And it was brought together back in the early, late, late 70s, early 80s, as a, as a re result of people recognizing that there were complex issues that were facing the management entities because of either decline of water supply or because more people or because of the institutional requirements there was a need to put together some program and adaptive management was it that allowed people to collect data, analyze that data and have the flexibility to change their decisions if the data showed it. I would contend that today, much of the adaptive management programs and I track about a hundred of them around the world are having struggles because of this issue of climate change, the very issue of the point of this conference and the variability and the extreme events and everything that climate change is dropping upon us now. And that much of the governance that we have designed and implemented since the 1970s around the concept of adaptive management is challenged today because of this variability, because of these extreme events, and because of the challenges that are being presented to us because of climate change. And I would first, I would, one of my initial conclusions here is that we need to respond to this by taking a hard look at our governance and institutional organizations to see how they might need to be adapted. So adaptive governance uh, to, to address these challenges that we are going to be facing in, here in the future. Science continues to expand and we continue to deal with new increasing science community. But we also need to make sure that our capacity to make decisions with that science expands along with it. And so I think I'll leave my point there and move on. Thank you very much, David. And we'll come back as well in the discussion to this question. Whenever we say, look, we need to respond to climate change, exactly what are we responding to in the context of adaptive management and the uncertainty of that information as well. So next up, I'm going to ask Nisha Pryor. Um, basically from the State Department, a senior um, water expert, to speak a little bit to the, if she wants, to the global water security agenda, and then other issues related to the engagement of the U.S. and others, or states like the U.S. in this context. Um, part of the subtext, I'm going to come back and bring people like Aaron Salzberg and others into the discussion as to whether or not many of, and you don't need to speak to this, many of the things that we might be Planning, achieving might be set back in the losses of democratic institutions around the globe. So, Nisha. Thank you. So I should give the floor actually to Aaron. Who, um, yeah. So I should give the floor to Aaron first, who um, really was the guiding force for our water team at the State Department. But I will clarify, I am not a water expert. I'm a diplomat, I'm yeah. not a scientist. So I'm going to share a slightly different perspective on things. I'll say I have yet to serve in a country that has not um, been contending with transboundary water cooperation. And that's not surprising. There are over 260 shared water watersheds around the world. Um, and I intentionally use the word cooperation, not conflict. I think too often our nomenclature is simple and we refer to it as transboundary water conflict. There is a lot of cooperation going on, um, even if it's not obvious from the news or um, you know from outside perspective. I think there is almost always technical cooperation going on. There is a desire in the technical world of um, of the partners to have cooperation across borders on waters on water, and at the same time, I was happy during the plenary when Rosario mentioned um, and and talked about how water is not just a water issue. There's more to it. There's a socioeconomic dimension, there's a cultural dimension, and it's often, the waters are often embedded in the countries 
or in a nation's national identity. So it's quite com complicated. Um, the global water strategy, first say that I'm in the Bureau of Oceans and Environmental and Scientific Cooperation. So we lead for the Interagency on Cooperation for support on um, technical assistance and multilateral diplomacy to reduce water as a source of conflict. And as much as our partners do ask and need assistance, financial assistance for large infrastructure projects, um, it is we hear from them at a commiserate level that they also need technical assistance and other assistance in um, coming together with their partners. So there is a lot that we can do and we help with our partners at the Department of Energy and USA, NOAA, NASA, many other um, partners in the interagency to meet those needs of technical assistance or um, help in multilateral lateral organizations. And just as an example on some of the technical needs that we often hear that are not big dollar items. Um, they would need help in um, getting better information on remote sensing, water reuse and forecasting so they can understand um, current and future uh, needs and availability. So uh, Roger asked me to talk about the global water strategy. So we have a global water strategy with state and the and USAID from 2022 to 2027. And there's four strategic objectives in there. They all um, overlap with transboundary water, water needs, but one of them is specifically, uh, I'll read out things afterwards, is specifically focused on um, preventing conflict related to water. And in that section, we talk about transboundary water issues. So we are very much focused on, um, on this issue in our relationships around the world. I wanted to point out that regional and international institutions are crucial for ensuring collaboration. And so those sound institutions are where we want to head to uh, with managing some of this cooperation. So we need to, we want to help empower them and make them stronger when invited in. And one way of helping them is um, ensuring that they have the members of those institutions have the data and the expertise and the know-how to manage the water issues that they're facing. And so um, then, yeah, finally, finally, my big point here was that progress is slow. And we heard in the plenary about, um, and you think and you have also said there's challenges and what more can we do? There is a lot we can do and there are a lot of problems and this keeps a six person water team fully occupied. Um, but there's a lot of progress out there. As I said, at the technical level, countries do want to cooperate. Um, and so there is a lot and progress is slow. The big wins that you'll see in the news may be few and far between, but they are they are there, they do come. Um, there's a role for um, partners that are invited in. There's a role for international Peace, uh, sorry, environmental peace organizations as well in this. There's a lot of ways that everyone can help. And then I will sum up by saying that water can be a source of cooperation. And as I highlighted, bilateral and multilateral diplomacy are tools as much as technical assistance and um, financial assistance are could be tools. And regional, international, and multilateral institutions all have a role as well. Thank you very much. Nisha, uh, giving us a strong sense of both where we're going and what the gaps are. Again, we're going to come back to this issue of linking science, decision making and institutions um, and say, where do we enter into that space and how have we done to date? So next up, GLE, hi, yes. <laughs> from the World Bank. Um, and what I've asked, there are economic tools that are being used in this space. And I'd ask Gia to address some of those, but then also to speak to some of their limitations and what we might do to overcome them in the context of understanding the economics of transboundary resources and um, the use of e economics such as benefit cost analysis anyway. Thank you. Wait. Thank you, Roger. It's a pleasure to be here. When I was working in the US government, I was often here and it's really nice to be back. Um, so maybe I would start a little bit of anecdote. A um, couple of months ago, I was on um, work travel in Eastern Africa. So I was in Zambia, Tanzania. And at the time, Zambia just had their worst drought in 40 years. 
so Zambia was mostly relying on hydropower. And uh, when we were there, we we're experiencing a lot of uh, blackouts. Um, while at the same time, we were talking, actually, we were there talking about regional resilient infrastructure to really help the countries to think about how to think about systems, thinking about transboundary issues. And one thing that came from you know, some of the modeling work is very clear. What the country and the region needs is more interconnected power grid. So when Zambia was having drought um, you know, in Zambezi River, um, having drought, the Congo River Basin actually was having more water. So a very simple solution would just be a you know, power connector, but they don't have that. So it's many level of challenges, infrastructure, governance, and policy, um, to some extent finance as well. Uh, at the same time, you know, Zambia was having uh, food insecurity because of the drought. They actually lost half of their crops. And Tanzania at the same time was having more rainfall. So wouldn't it be nice if there's just trade of agricultural products. Um, but, you know, sometimes I think these constraints are uh, multiple levels and I very much agree with what David said. Um, but we also see a lot of progress as well. I think, you know, talking about the the connection between science and progress, um, you know, from my vintage point now working on development, we oftentimes start with the development needs in countries. So it's not just addressing climate, it's not just, you know, decarbonization or thinking about climate resilience. We need to start thinking about where their development needs are, what countries' aspirations are. And from there, integrating climate impacts and thinking about different ways to um, look at the development pathways to actually achieve the aspiration, but in a way which would help the country in the longer term. And uh, there are many decisions needs to be made, both in the short term um, for any investment and in the long term planning. I think science actually make a really um, big contribution there. But we also have to think about how the tr science translates to where the country's needs are. Um, so in that conversation, there's a lot of discussion around data for hydromeds, you know, just um, basic projections and early warnings. And that's where I found many countries actually lack the capacity, but there's a huge desire to collaborate and cooperate. And this is where the, the governance and collaboration at multiple levels, you know, from international community to think about regional organizations and thinking about where the cap capacity is um, and, and, you know, structure in a way that country um, collaboration can happen, also meeting the, the, the user needs. This user will be very diverse. You know, it could be different ministries. Transport needs very different data from agriculture or from energy. So, you know, understanding that, I think it's really important. And there are some good examples of regional collaboration around data, which actually really spur this collaboration and building trust um, like Hydromed, a um, lot of the work Roger's doing actually, um, like in different regions, um, as a good starting point. And uh, as economists, yes, I have been doing a lot of work around cost-benefit analysis, really thinking about how do you incorporate climate considerations and particularly uncertainty in the economic analysis. It's not very easy because our standards, economic analysis, cost-benefit analysis does not address uncertainty very well. Uh, the other thing that, you know, needs innovation for one, you know, sometimes we develop tools to incorporate deep uncertainties in the decision making. So that really expands beyond just one discipline, one type of methodology. Um, so I do a lot of collaboration with teams doing um, decision making under uncertainty that also bringing uh, diverse world views as well. It's not just a physical science uncertainty, it's also the human dimensions. How do we make decisions? And oftentimes they may be in conflict with each other. So the other point is, um, you know, very much I think when we talk about science, it needs to be coming in different disciplines in, and interdisciplinary. And we also need to think about, you know, what does science mean? It's not just what scientists think what science is, but also what users are needing and what they understand as impacts. So there has to be a two-way um, conversation. So I will stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so as you could tell in building the stories and we're getting to more of this, I'm gonna ask the audience and everybody else. Um, Jay mentioned something really interesting here, which is the idea of not just being proactive, what is impending and how do you respond? 
but starting with Dave, Nisha, and others, and then you'll hear more of this. What does it mean to be prospective? Well, how do you not let new risks arise? And that comes from what she was asking in terms of what are the development questions? What are the goals? Where are the practices? How is this layered? So that then we ask the climate question. So I do want us to get, you know, in discussions like this, increasingly, we've been saying, oh, let's, you know, science isn't enough and we need to get to uh, governance and decision making. We need to do all of it. So I want to make sure that we're asking the question in the way she, Dave, and others are framing it. What does it take to make us prospective in terms of avoiding future risks? As I'd like to tell people, it's not a question of responding to climate change, it's making sure that we do not create problems like climate change. So next up, we have David Feldman. And what I wanted to get from David as a start, and of course with a long and rich history, is just what are some mechanisms through which we can actually learn from each other? We know we ought to collaborate, but are we learning? I like to call it learning, doing and not learning is what we do a lot of. So what's the diversity of the ways in which we- Thank you very much, Roger. It's a pleasure to be here. I wanna begin by uh, acknowledging the National Science Foundation's ExcelNet program for its support of Peer-to-Peer, -peer, which is a progress project that I and many others are working on, which in fact is addressing this very question of what can we learn from one another in different transboundary situations? I wanna make three major points this afternoon. Uh, the first is that when we talk about what we can learn from one another in terms of adaptive management for water and climate vulnerability, we need to start with what constitutes effective science diplomacy for, uh, for uh, adaptive management. Uh, and usually we think of it as meaning adoptive a comprehensive and integrated approach that embraces hydrological, ecological, economic, and institutional factors that lead to vulnerability. This is true. And we know that it must also ideally employ an inclusive process that confers with diverse and often underrepresented groups in developing this comprehensive approach. One of the things that we found in our work in peer-to-peer -peer in Central Asia and in the Middle East is that unfortunately what scientists actually measure and monitor and use for science diplomacy is driven by powerful economic interests and not always or necessarily the needs of the least well off. We need to pay better attention to such things as gender and ethnic equity issues. For example, with respect to water and climate, uh, do women have access to land rights? Can they have access to credit in order to adopt adaptive management options for water uh, under the pressures of climate change? Also health impacts, which are very important in terms of the data that we wanna collect, are often difficult to assess because they revolve around latent illnesses and infirmities that are hard to, to uh, document without long-term data. So we need to do a better job on that front. With respect to adaptive governance, which is another very important quality of adaptive management, the distinction here is the capacity of institutions to mitigate vulnerability, uh, to adopt, for example, various water storage or water augmentation alternatives. And we know that these alternatives and their applicability is affected by what we might call exogenous climate factors. Does a particular society have too little water or too much water? Does climate change exacerbate one side of that quotient or the other? But what we also have to consider is the role of endogenous factors. Again, disparities due to socioeconomic, gender, ethnic, educational achievement, and other factors, which in fact constrain or allow a society to in fact develop uh, institutions and the institutional capacity to adopt to climate change and its impacts on water. Uh, if we're going to select for uh, certain conservation and reuse methods for water management, for example, we have to be especially cognizant of the range of viable options given their affordability in a certain society. And let us not forget the importance of cultural and public acceptability. Where I live in Southern California, wastewater reuse 
for potable and non-potable purposes is widely utilized and accepted it would not be as acceptable in many developing nations, particularly due to re religious values. This is something we certainly know from experience in parts of the Middle East. So we have to be sensitive to those social and cultural acceptability factors. And finally, I wanna say something about regional transboundary collaboration. One of the things that we know in adoptive management experiences is that uh, Efforts to share water amicably and equitably uh, often fail to ensure either equity or the proper protection of ecological resources. This is a huge challenge worldwide. Adaptive management requires that decision makers ideally incorporate lessons from previous failures in order not to make the same mistakes the next time around. One of the approach, the approach that we've learned in peer-to-peer -peer is the need for what might be called forensic reconstruction of cases. That is a very clear and straightforward analysis of why certain efforts at adapting adoptive management techniques have failed. And we've actually concluded three major factors are paramount. One is the willingness or lack of willingness of decision makers to accept the veracity of water data or to share it. This is often constrained by distrust or a lack of confidence in the source of the data. Secondly, how well is the data translated into a form that's understandable for diverse users? We're not just talking about scientists collecting data and talking to other scientists, but talking to decision makers and to non-governmental organizations. And lastly, perceptual differences across political spaces often filter how parties use information and what they choose to believe about that information. So these are very important constraints. I wanna sum up with some concluding observations about adaptive management and what we've learned about communicating across boundaries with one another. Uh, and I'll start out with this. Uh, adaptive management does not postpone actions until enough is known about a problem so that you can solve the problem with wholesome, rigorous data. Instead, adaptive management ideally supports actions that acknowledge the limits of scientific knowledge, actively incorporates vulnerable groups in efforts to reduce vulnerability, and again, and counts for these endogenous factors that affect vulnerability, such as income, education, gender, and ethnic disparities. A second concluding lesson, to state that there are lessons to be learned from failures that not always imply that we actually learn. And this is a huge challenge in adaptive management. Uh, social learning <clears throat> requires a willingness to concede error and a willingness to uh, pursue a different course of action. Close to home, we see this here in the Southwest, for example, in my region with the Colorado River, a compact that works very well and has worked very well, but unfortunately, many of the protagonists have not used the most current data and information to update what is otherwise a good baseline agreement. So a path forward, three points. We need to better incorporate vulnerable groups and their needs when we develop adaptive management frameworks. Secondly, with respect to transboundary cooperation, we need to face the fact that laws and policies governing transboundary water rights, which are also often path dependent, we do what we do because we've always done it that way, we need to be prepared to reform these policies when they are not in accord with the most current information. And lastly, in terms of data and the usefulness of data, we need to invest in user education and we need to ensure equitable access, including data literacy. We spend a lot of attention on collecting data. We don't often spend a lot of time in making sure that users know uh, where it comes from, how it was generated, how it should be used, and how it can be misused. That's 
I'll stop there. Splendid. Thank you very much, David. Uh, rich and multidimensional. And to his point about the attention on mistakes, it's kind of like why I, I know you learn from your mistakes. That's why I only make mistakes. The, um, the other sort of question that's raised, and again, you would hear it. Years ago, there was a study in the 1960s called Drawers of Water. And of course, the education that was being undertaken was mostly with men until someone asked the question, Gilbert White asked the question, who carries the water? You can ask very simple questions to uncover areas of vulnerability and inequity. These do not take large complex approaches to handle. And of course that changed the way UNDP did most of its training and education. I want us to keep in mind because we're dealing with very complex systems and we're not asking, uncertainty is unavoidable in the evolution of uh, um, society and the environment. We're asking where the entry points are in order to be adaptive and to learn. I'm gonna come back to the entire panel on that issue of learning and the ways in which we learn. And then a critical question of who is to do it. And so we'll, we'll get there, All right? So lastly, we have Rosario again, because she had such important things to say, we asked her to come back. <laughs> and from this experience, I do want to mention, this gives us a really clear case, right? Surface, ground. Upstream and downstream, we, we have a sense, we know is always the source of, of, of you know, tension, if not conflict. I had the forecasters for the Nile in my office two weeks ago on a whole host of issues related to that. But groundwater here is central. And I will say, as much as we're saying, yes, the institutions, they do matter. Right now, both sides are hurting on the US-Mexico border and pointing to each other as to who's shortening the water when in fact, there is no water. We have sort of hit a limit. So I wanna come back to Rosario and ask the question, or at least address the question, how do you think in the context of groundwater, in the partnerships on data, we can be more inclusive in our approaches. In other words, how do we engage more constructively in the management of transboundary aquifers? And if you don't like that um, question, I have others. I really want another question. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I guess how, how the question is, how do we do it better? Sure. How do we do a better job? Um, there's a lot of, did you hear me? Because I, yeah, the other, yeah, the, yeah. nobody heard yeah. me. Yeah, the, the question, is, the question is, is to build on what you just said before too, how are we doing in your setting and how do we do it better? I guess we're doing better because the conditions are forcing us to do it better. Um, I don't want to say it, but really chaos drives change. And it's the opportunity for creativity. It's the opportunity to, is a momentum to bring it on the table. And that's what we're trying to do, at least on, on my area of, of expertise and on the region between US and Mexico, because it's a big border and it's not a small border uh, and, and it's not full of challenges already and everything bingles and everything becomes something else. Um, and then there's a surface water too issue. And then so try to, sometimes there's just too many issues at the same time. So authorities get like, a, a, okay, first things first, right? First thing is a treaty and then the, so the, that's the kind of the agenda, the political agenda until you run out of surface water, right? Uh, and, and we are there. So we have lessons learned. We have good examples on the Rio Colorado River. They're not perfect, of course, but they are, you know, there are things that we can learn from. And all of them include first inclusion, stakeholders participation, uh, research, a 50 year model that has been worked on the Colorado River. And then I'm gonna, you know, switch to the Rio Grande and how that differs. And the history, of course, is different. The history between Mexico and California, Arizona is a bit different than the history between Mexico and Texas. Um, is there somebody from Texas here? No. You can say whatever you want. Are you sure? I, I've been recording. <laughs> <laughs> Who is from Texas? <laughs> OK, me too. So uh, it's hard. Uh, that, that basin is really, really hard. 
So, but we can learn from it. And I think we are there is we're just a little bit late uh, because the basin has uh, lost roughly 80% of the river flow over the last hundred years. Current demands and, and prospective water demands are, are really uh, based on models, well, not, not even models, projections of 1940s that has been triplicated. Uh, so there's more water and paper that is water in the basin right now. It's not like Mexico can high water from Texas or vice versa. So I guess the that's where we come in. Like, hey, there's groundwater. Don't fight to each other. I mean, let's talk about groundwater. Uh, still, there's a lot of misinformation. There's a lot of no information. Uh, the fact that we were able to publish that map of transboundary aquifers two years ago speaks of the lack of information. That's scary. Scary to know that that's all that we have. But that doesn't mean we can't do anything, even with that level of misinformation and lack of information, because we cannot deny that border communities are using groundwater right now because of lack of surface water. It's around 10 million people that rely on transboundary aquifers for domestic use of their sole source of water right now, which is non-regulated. Um, and we just don't know um, when when authorities ask us where how can we how are we doing in, in aquifers? They say, well, I have no idea. I mean, we we need to do a lot more work. And the way towards that usually is uh, try to recognize that connection between surface and groundwater. If we are able to communicate and to send the message in a way that even though the treaty only covers surface water, but it's dependable on base flow of, of, of groundwater in the border, then it makes a little more sense. We don't have that chip that, of, of the interconnection of surface and groundwater. We just don't have it. Uh, not, in, not in our legal frameworks, not in the treaty, not, not even in the uh, decision makers. I mean, it's kind of, oh, that's something else. That's regulated, but something else, that's another governance system. I mean, it's a, a little bit of the dilutional kind of a, what are you talking about? That surface water is so no, I mean, yes, but no, <laughs> they are connected. Right now, all the base flow in the summer on the Rio Grande comes from groundwater. And you know, that. so, but to, to have them understand, or to have decision makers understand that connectivity, it has taken a while, but I think eventually they'll, they'll, they'll get to that. Now, what would that mean in the long term? And yeah. should I stop now? No. Because I can't be here forever. Uh, but no, I'm going to stop. Because most of we run out of groundwater. <laughs> yeah, good point. That's the big question. So, so that interconnection has, has helped the system, in a, the system in a way. The, the fact that we prefer it to not know it. It's a very common condition, like, okay, so people are relying more on groundwater and it's not regulated. Why do we need to care about it, right? Um, so it's very negligent. We, we tend to look at it in a very negligent way because we don't see it, because we don't monitor, because we don't know what the system looks like. So it's like a, a fear of knowing. So if you fear, what you don't know, so don't touch it, right? Let it let it go until something happens. So the, I, I guess that's the that's the umbrella, the environment that we work in every day to try to see. No, this is important. Um, just recently, we've been in those meetings. The first, I guess, uh, open up academic community meetings officially, and they would prefer to talk about groundwater because it's a touchy subject, because it's a political subject, because we don't know much about it, then we're fe and then we fear about it, and because it will re re require another governance system uh, across the basin, which comes back to, you know, we don't have a good governance systems. We don't even have a governance system, not even good or bad, we just don't. 
So uh, nothing that we can share. But but I've I've experienced um, again at a local scale, very very local scale, groundwater uh, districts that are interested in what's going on on the other side because they know that what if the recharge area is in the other side, and we rely on this source for the future. So the the opportunity. It's at a local scale, not really at a macro formal scale. I think we can do more like between you and me than between all of us. Um, so it's it's closer approaches, trust building, uh, capacity building, social capacity building that, that drives the change on a little by a little basis. And I don't know if I answered the question. You did. But also you answered it well. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I'll leave it there. No, no, no. Thank you very much, because this is tying together several of the threads. Just in case you're thinking this is U.S. and Mexico, we also have no groundwater agreements between the U.S. and Canada. So this is a, a global issue, regardless of the, the status of the economies or anything else. And I wanted to tie it back to something um, a long time ago that James March and others called symbolic rationality. And you heard this from Dave Feldman, you know, this uh, idea of willingness to accept or share information and raised by Rosario, another form of symbolic rationality, which is it's rational for me not to know in the sense that then I don't have to deal with it. Years ago, I asked someone who um, some people in the room would know who had led the negotiations for Nevada on the Colorado Compact. I asked a brilliant, brilliant person, I asked her, what was the plan to deal with the shortages on the Colorado River in the planning? She said, the plan was for it not to happen in my lifetime. So we do want to be clear that those are the kinds of things that are actually driving many of the decisions. But then to Rosario's point, there's an issue with scaling, right? We can find causes because their impact, the focusing event is near. So local communities work together, but there has to be a scaling up. We've learned from adaptive management as Dave Wagner knows better than anybody else. Smaller watersheds can have partnerships, but the entire main stem can be in decline. And so we want to make sure that we are understanding how to build from those successes most effectively. And to Dave Feldman, Feldman's point is, do we make sure, how do we make sure the lessons are not just drawn, but learned? And a lot of the tools we're hearing about in agreements, global agreements and in economics help us do some of that. So what I'd like to do is first ask the panel, do you have any clarifying questions for other plant panelists? And then open it up for a discussion. And if not, I'll pose some questions to the audience. See, you weren't here to be inactive. Thank you. Any questions for each of you or about what you heard from each other? Please, Dick. Well, I would like to hear from the audience because I think that's often where we get the most interesting questions. No, so that's that's true. We have the opportunity to talk to each other. No, the idea was to clarify for the sake of the audience any questions you had from your perspective. I, I like to offer that up. All right. Questions, comments, assertions, finger pointing. And um, please, when you do, just introduce yourself um, and say where you're from and how you're going to fund Transboundary Corporation. Okay. Challenges? There we go. Thank you. Don't test the water with both feet. Sure. I appreciate so, that. Someone has to go first. Yes. Uh, Will Veach, I run the Climate Preparedness and Resilience Program for the US Army Corps of Engineers. Um, I was struck by Gia's uh, remark about um, the need for planning under deep uncertainty. The Army Corps is currently undergoing a revolution of sorts in the way we compute project benefits, where rather than considering economic benefits first, we're now attempting to consider all the comprehensive benefits of our projects to society equally. Um, and this is a challenge because some of those are monetizable, some are not, um, some are, but it is distasteful to do so. Um, and so I'm interested from the panel, any thoughts on how to bring together this concept of multi-criteria decision analysis with uh, deep uncertainty with other ways of knowing? Thank you very much. I do in, want to make one comment. In a changing climate, Sorry, please. Another one. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Um, the person driving a lot of this from the Corps of Engineers is the person who also negotiated Minute 320 on the Colorado River, the first time 
water was provided from one country to another for environmental purposes. There's a sea change in thinking. I mean, we worked together on the Secure Water Act. With it. I want to show, I'm saying that only to show that leadership does matter in the context of what questions you're allowed to ask and what opens up this kind of investigation. So from the standpoint of multi-criteria analysis and so on, let me ask Jia and anybody else after you. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that um, comment. Um, so from you know some of the work that I've been doing and also in collaboration with others, uh, we very much recognize when you look at economic analysis, oftentimes it's limited in terms of really representing uh, the full range of costs and benefits. You know, we don't do very well with, um, you know, just quantification and or sh we shouldn't in some cases. Um, so the multi-criteria um, approach has been used pretty widely in different decision-making context. Um, and the other thing I would say, um, I'm losing my thought a little bit. I think on the, in terms of the uncertainty, I think it's also important to rec recognize and represent some of the uncertainty or different perspectives on the impacts as well. So I think it, it is important. This actually comes back to the, the comment around inclusion and around diversity. And we, we do need to represent different beliefs or you know views. Um, and it, that, that oftentimes give you a very different set of um, probably optimal solutions. So the, the, to the extent we can disaggregate and we can represent those different streams of cost benefit implications and and you know in our own work too we don't always present the monetize the benefits cost um, but we look at other indicators as well um so I would very love to very much love to have an exchange on that um you know one challenge for us um, is it depends on the scale of decisions it's not always easy or you know um, makes sense to do this like full range of uncertainty analysis so we try to tailored to the decision context and at least being able to communicate that working with teams who are making decisions. And in some cases it will be simplified as well. Uh, I'll, can, I, can I say a few words on that? Great question, because this is the issue that we are facing with climate change. We have to pivot from the traditional way we've done business to finding new ways to do business, or at least to embrace the history as we carry it forward into the future. I would contend there are a couple of things, I'll, since you work for the core, I'll use the core as an example, but it's, it's incumbent upon all our federal agencies. There is always agency culture. Some agencies are more adept at pivoting quickly or embracing new ideas. I would contend the EPA as being one of our youngest federal agencies is able to seemingly to do that a little quicker. The core with its long history going all the way back to uh, George Washington has a long history that they're, that they're working within. There's also the agency perspective on how they do work, how they do their job. And in the core, they've always been um, primarily driven by engineering engineers. So gray infrastructure is, you know, concrete and rebar, that's their middle name. And so to try to embrace, and we heard it this morning in the nature-based solution um, session, it's hard for them to embrace the climate issues associated with nature-based solutions because gray infrastructure, its most value is on day one. Once you open that structure, you, you dedicate that levy or that seawall, its value diminishes from then on because it's deteriorating, it's concrete and rebar, it's gonna erode. Whereas nature-based solutions, you don't see the full benefit of planting mangroves along the coastline of Florida for maybe 10, 15, 20 years out. And our valuation systems that OMB and the agencies use to score are not adapted to try to embrace those sorts of approaches to how do you value these, these entities? And I, I, I know for a fact that OMB is having trouble and the agent, the core and the Bureau Rec and all of our water management agencies is how do you Im embed ecosystem services? How do you capture that? How do you deal with climate services? I work with a lot of tribes in the Southwest. They have cultural services 
the value of that stream or that spring or that wetland to them for cultural purposes as for their religion or for you know just their organizational how their tribe embraces that we don't have a good way to do it that's where we need new new information we need more economists sociologists looking at these issues and lastly before i turn it back to roger i would contend that the core has some great opportunities here the institute of water resources joe manus and his folks they're doing a great job of trying to bring those issues forward but i think if joe was sitting in the room here today he would be the first to admit he doesn't even though he's within the core of engineers he's having a hard time reaching the assistant secretaries and some of the folks that need to hear some of the new approaches because they're difficult to embrace they're difficult to implement and it's risk it's risky to do some of these things and the federal government is not a big entity on embracing risk so doing that is going to be one of the challenges that i see but also a great opportunity so I want to be clear. I didn't want you to be rotten to the core. You get it? Anyway, all right. Hey, I just made that up. Okay. So, but but what we wanted to get in this setting, and Rosario raised it, right? Lots of opportunities at local levels, but we do need to scale up. We do want to be clear that when we're talking about the partnerships, federal, private, civil society, each has different time frames. Anytime someone says to me, oh, politicians work on a four-year, said the private sector work on a quarterly time frame. Right? So we have to ask the question, where are the partnerships most efficient? And then where are the broader ones, such as the core is dealing with, in meeting multiple goals of equity, as opposed to just one? So I think, uh, I mean, this idea of scaling up is really critical. Other comments? Thanks, Dave. Yeah, just a couple of quick comments to amplify what's already been said. I think one of the things in terms of scale, when we talk about the answer to your question, what we ought to be striving for is resilience which is making sure that every drop of water we have and might have in the future is being managed in such a way to make sure that we're looking at every single option available. And I think in terms of partnerships, one of the things that nature-based solutions, green infrastructure, whatever we'd like to call it, remind us is that there needs to be more thought given to partnerships at a very local scale, a community scale where you get communities to buy into accepting, uh, you know, the use of pavers, uh, pervious surfaces, rethinking the built environment in our urban spaces in ways that go beyond simply, you know, building a dam or levying a river. And so it's really going to require a new kind of partnership between local governments, community groups, non-governmental organizations, and of course, private investors to sustain this infrastructure. So I think that's very important. And then lastly, uh, scenario-based planning, uh, thinking about what are some of the possibilities in the future for what options are going to be most available to us uh, given climate change. Uh, and this is something I think that as David pointed out, very difficult given the culture of many of our agencies. But if we partner, at the community level, not just fed federal agencies, but the federal agencies, the states and communities, we can get there. I, I wanna come back and I'll put this back to the audience as well, Dave. I do wanna get back to, you know, the idea of centralized versus decentralized is always critical, but in the disaster arena, we've learned a long time ago, if you're decentralized without support, you're not decentralizing. And that what we mean by that, however, is accountability also has to take place at a scale higher than the local. There are elites at the local level too. So every time we discover the local, I wanna make sure that we're actually, especially in terms of gender, that we're actually managing that process effectively. Well, well taken. So thanks. Let's, um, other questions or comments? Otherwise I'm gonna put Salzburg on the spot. Yes. So uh, somebody defend him. Yes. <laughs> Hi, I'm Sarah. Sarah Levitt from the Nature Conservancy. Um, and I work in adaptive management in the climate mitigation space, um, but including a couple of projects that deal with transboundary watersheds or, or wetland ecosystems in US and Mexico and Angola and Botswana. So I was really interested to hear the examples the panelists have provided so far. Um, and I'm curious to know if you all have any examples of adaptive management management strategies 
that haven't worked that you could share? The session isn't long enough. <laughs> Other, um, anybody want to take that on? I do have a quick comment on it. So that haven't worked, Dave, you know these in spades. Well, I would contend that there are several examples in the West and Southwest in particular where the agencies have said, well, we're going to embrace an adaptive management approach on some small river systems and such. Um, and then they don't support them either financially or uh, with data collection in terms of academics or the federal agencies. And so to, to give you specific examples, the Animas River in Colorado, where we had some challenges many years ago now for developing the Animas La Plata project, um, which then when they couldn't get through as a federal agency directed entity, it, they got wrapped up in a Indian water settlement, so there could be no debate. So the science wasn't even considered in that particular area. The adaptive management approach that we locally, and I was we were heavily involved in that locally, um, it was just thrown away. Um, I, there's other examples of smaller river systems, the Klamath, um, years ago before we now have the four dams being removed, but historically in the Water Science Technology Board here at the National Academy of Sciences was involved did some really good work on looking at the science. And then politically, it just didn't sit well with that administration. And they did away with the science and just said, we're going to open up the irrigation canals again, or the irrigation gates. So there are multiple examples of that. But I, as Roger said, we when you make mistakes, you learn from mistakes, I would hope. And I think we've learned from both of those examples how you could approach this a little differently and the value of organization and collaboration. Greatly appreciated. So um, as we move towards wrapping up, I will ask in order to prepare them, the panel to make a comment, but the comment I'm gonna ask you to make in from your own background, your partnerships, who is to do it? What sort of new training is needed? As I like to tell people, I work a lot in climate services internationally. We don't need more people doing GIS badly. It's a little bit more interactive than that. So I want to, I will ask each of you from your own background and discipline, what might be helpful in that setting. I really like the question a great deal. Um, Carl Walters, one of the inventors of the phrase adaptive management, along with Buzz Holling, years ago, did an assessment of 200 cases around the world of adaptive management in watersheds. All of them were modeling successes, as Charles Lindblom used to, to paraphrase, modeling through. Anyway. Um, but only four were implementation successes. And the only reason ones that were, you're looking at the type of people that makes them successes. The three things that made them were one, a willingness to collect data on even difficult things such as vulnerability. And two, acceptability as Dave Feldman said of trust in that information to act on it. And three, individuals who have dedicated their lives to making adaptive management work. That piece is not something we uncover a whole lot when we talk about governance. We talk about institutions, but not necessarily who is to do it. And so I wanna make sure that we're, you're seeing some of them here and some of them are in the room. We need to get back to our universities and academia providing the people we need. So I, don't, I just wanna keep that from the standpoint of successes and so on. Um, before I begin to ask you the question to wrap up, I did want to introduce Aaron Salzberg and ask Aaron for all the things you've been hearing all of this time. Um, and, and especially with, you know, like I was mentioning the retreat, we saw that we're seeing this in, disaster, in the disasters world as well. Integrated approaches have been recommended for years and integrated approaches as, as has been said by you and others are easy now to describe but not necessarily to implement in practice. Can you just say something about the, either the limits to those or how we get to an integrated view if we need one. And thanks for taking this bait. <laughs> no, I can I can try, um, but I think a lot of your panelists kind of hinted at this and you even kind of summarized this a little bit at the end too. Um, you know, at the end of the day, process matters. Um, and I don't think we use the P word often enough. We, we focus a lot on products and we don't focus a lot on the process and how we get to those products. And, and that process is where we actually build 
the social co uh, the social resilience, the social capacity, the social cohesion, where we build that institutional resilience and we find the flaws in institutions and we can help rework institutions. Um, and, and I know that that in many cases, that process goal is in conflict with many of our other goals, which is, no, I got a problem I got to solve. Um, and so how do I solve that problem? But when we're dealing with transboundary water on top of, and we talk add, add on top of that climate, add on top of that food systems and energy systems, you know, these are complex systems of systems and the problems that we're gonna see are not based on linear cause and effect relationships. We're not gonna see that anymore. Uh, and, and which means the problems we're gonna see are gonna be emergent from these complex combinations of systems of systems. And, and that means the only hope that we've got is that we've built that resilience uh, within our institutions to be able to take in information and contextualize it in the proper way and make good decisions based on, on what we've got in all the uncertainty that we have. And so, and, and the only way that happens again to me is that process step. And I think that's what you pointed on in terms of wh what were the factors of success uh, and those factors of success were that, uh, you know, we talk a lot about data, but we don't talk a lot about that data collection process, right? Because data is not neutral. And if you're collecting the data as to whether this is black or white, and he wants it to be white and I want it to be black, that means that answering that data question is going to make a political statement about how we solve our problem. And that has to be socialized in advance of you finding your answer to your data. And so again, the process of data collection, the process of how we integrate that into what we're doing, I think matters. But uh, I think many of your speakers got to that. Greatly appreciate it. And can you just say just for everyone what your present job is and your past job? Uh, my present job is I now, I'm the director of the Water Institute at the University of North Carolina. Uh, and I spent many years in the Department of State, uh, several as the special coordinator for water where I led international water issues for the US. And responsible for many of the successes that we've actually had. And many of the failures. I, but being honest, too. So, okay, no. So thank you. I'm in the interest of time. I'm, I am going to come back. There is an issue here that we're, we're mentioning, we're talking about. But the idea of financing resilience up front is never easy. We've known for years that $1 now saves us so much in the future, whether it's disasters or anything else. That up front requires the type of partnerships and information that Aaron was just talking about. Otherwise, we don't get it happening, right? The return on investment over the long term is too much. So I do want to keep that in mind. Um, so I'm going to ask each of the speakers just to say from your perspective, just if you want to say whatever is most important and also from your background, what sort of training of new professionals are actually needed in partnerships with, it doesn't have to be in partnerships with National Academy, but with whatever role you're playing, we're obviously not creating a cadre of professionals if we only have individuals who are doing it. So I'll start with Dave Feldman as the educator. All right. Well, I'm going to go out on a little bit of a limb here and say that most of the major problems in the water climate domain, as we've talked about in this panel, are not purely technical issues. They're human dimensions issues. And as an educator, I believe what our students need is a firm grounding in the liberal arts the social sciences and the humanities, being able to talk to people, to communicate across disciplinary boundaries is essential if we're gonna get from where we are to where we wanna be in terms of adaptive management. I'll go a little further out on a limb and saying the fields of philosophy and comparative religion are important. It's very interesting and my students in environmental policy know this, most of the world's major religions devote a lot of writings to the role of water and culture and the importance of stewardship and humility and care for the domains that cannot care for themselves. That's an important lesson, regardless of whether one's training is engineering, physical science, or my discipline, political science. I'd like to see a comprehensive revisiting of a liberal arts education for our water professions. Thank you very much. See, this is a little bit of roulette, Gia. That's a little bit hard to follow. And I wish I had that. Um, <laughs> no completely ditto. agree. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, so I guess from my work, uh, sometimes I see the opportunity. I also really agree with the point about the process. I think it's really important for any profession 
to be involved in the process. You know, you might have your disciplinary, um, you know, expertise, and but you need to be in that discussion to really understand what are the different perspectives and different competing interests and to solve. Um, so I think we cannot underestimate that. And from the educational perspective, I would say, you know, students or anyone wants to do pra a practice but needs to be involved in this experience and, and really apply it and uh, learn from that. Um, from just the, the work perspective, I think, you know, sometimes we hear a lot of the challenges, but I think there are a lot of solutions and opportunities at all levels as well. Maybe regional collaboration is difficult. Maybe it's the finance, maybe it's the political economy, but there are also levers at the national level that we need to think about all of them. Um, how to make sure resilience is considered in all the decisions. So this is always something that we need to focus on. And maybe it's not just on climate, but you know, in all the decisions, we need to integrate mainstream thinking about current risk, future risks. Um, economists are very good about incentives. I think we understand the human behavior side very well, that we respond to incentives. And in many cases, we do pretty well. But in the cases that we cannot solve, that's where the multi-level, you know, maybe governance and other intervention is needed. Data would be needed. Um, in terms of... Um, did I answer that? Yeah. Well, or well, <laughs> well, more... A plus. Okay. All right. <laughs> Happy to talk more. <laughs> oh, thank you. This is this is great. So let's go to Dave Wagner. Try to make sure he was reading something else when I called him, yeah. and then then uh, Nisha and Rosario. Yeah. I'll quickly go through. There's three things. First is education, and I second everything that my colleague here, David Feldman, said. We need to get students better prepared. That includes not only the the areas that David referred to, but also strategic thinking and systems thinking. We need to start thinking about systems. Secondly, we need to make sure there's support as we move forward. And that's an administration within the administration. How do we support people within that? But it means we've got to start taking those students who are coming out of the academic institutions and getting them into proper internship programs, getting them exposure to how science is used. One of the greatest things that um, one of our colleagues from UC Irvine did was to bring students to Washington, D.C., and I would walk them around to members of Congress and say, this is the people who are making the laws. They don't understand science. Interpret your work for them and make them do a 30-second elevator speech so that they could talk to those and show how they've done. And associated with that is use this organization at the National Academy of Sciences. This organization is critical to ensuring that science credibility is maintained. And I know science has gotten a really bad rap over the last several years ago. We've got to bring it back up to the, to the pedestal it needs to be on. And lastly is organization. I would contend that there are institutions like the Institute of Water Resources at the core that's underused, underutilized. There's also OSTP and CEQ who are above the agencies, they are administratively developed and implemented, they have to help bridge the gap between what the agencies can't or won't do for risk reasons to making sure that it carries forward with the new ways of valuing ecosystem services, climate services, cultural services. And lastly, Roger, I'm gonna throw this at you because you're the only guy I know who's actually working with the water sub cabinet right now, is to use forums that have been developed to bring the science forward, to make the agencies work together. It's critical in my perspective to ensure that's where how we implement adaptive management, how we utilize adaptive management and frame a, a roadmap forward. And thank you, Dave, in the interest of time, I'll have to move along. <laughs> I am super excited for this question. Um, we can help by, you can help by joining us, the State Department. Um, encourage your students, your colleagues to think about career at the department. Uh, all of our internships at the State Department are now paid. I'm uh, part of the selection committee that's going, going right now by chance, and I am shocked by the low number of applicants that there are. Um, housing is provided overseas or domestically if you're chosen, if the interns are chosen. It's a living wage. I think it was like $17 aside from the housing, something like that. 
Um, there are civil service jobs. You can be an expert on water alone, or you can join as a foreign service officer. You can pass and fail the foreign service exam every year until you're 55. Nothing is held against you. Please join. The reason I'm able to join this panel uh, with other water with water experts here and not actually have a PhD in science or water is because the things we're talking about here have so much overlap with other issues that we are trying to help other countries with. I was um, a director of narcotics and law enforcement in one country. We dealt with these same things and we had millions of dollars. Do we do capacity building workshops? Do we help them get information? Do we track the narcotic flow and share it publicly? What do we do about these things? They're um, overlapping issues with democracy, human rights, child trafficking, um, religious freedom, everything, you can name it. So please consider a career at State Department, encourage people, and my email will hopefully be shared. You can find me easily online, let anyone know, and I'm happy to help. I appreciate the plug towards public service. And careers.state.gov. Thank you. No, this is extremely important. <laughs> We're also trying to, to describe here, as you could tell from everyone, the fact that these jobs and working on these interstices are a professional risk for many people. Uh, we need to protect those roles. It isn't simply a department or an agency. Rosario, for the penultimate word. <laughs> oh my God, that's too. Uh, so uh, of course I second all my um, mentors here, uh, what they recommend. What I would add probably is a part of all the strategic thinking, the critical thinking. I think we have lost a lot of that in our younger generations. Critical thinking is a process, again, that we are not paying much attention to it because we are living in an age of misinformation. It's not an age of information, really. It's misinformation. And we are driven in our decisions are driven by that misinformation because we don't have the tools or the elements or the guidance to develop that critical thinking uh, in, in our students today. And that's scary. So that I would add that communication, which is you know the other side of the, how to communicate science effectively. How do we translate what we're saying to all types of communities? That's challenging and nobody teaches you that at grad school. Nobody teaches me to do it. And, and and you know we need to translate that for decision makers. What does this mean? And who cares about that? How would that be impacting your community at a local or macro scale? We don't have those tools. We don't have those skills developed. We need to start training on that because we thought that as a scientist, we just need to publish and get there. And that's it. But no, the challenges today require much more commitment and much more service and much more um, commitment to the local communities and, and to the challenges because we need to recognize it. It's not gonna be up to the governments to change the current state that we are. It's not. It's gonna be up to the communities and the local activism that we are able to build to make the changes. No successful government is gonna be able to make the necessary change to tackle the current climate challenges. We just don't have time for that to happen. So we need to build that into our younger generations to make them aware, because that's another one. We have underestimated the power of awareness too, uh, because we think we have to make all the decisions for somebody else without uh, noticing that actually the change will come from the community, from that local stakeholders involvement, from that inclusiveness, from that transparency, from that process of data generation. That's how you build trust. That's how you build social capacity and social community and true change, which means sustainable. Because it doesn't matter if we make the best decision right now, the federal government, another, another president will come in and we'll take it out. But what if that comes by an up? What if that's built into our communities? What if that's built on our local scale? That's something different. So we need to be more responsible and we need to train our students to be more active and more responsible because it's everybody's problem, right? It's not just the institutional problem. It's everybody's problem. With Perfect. That. No, thank you very much. I want to mention something you're hearing in Rosaria's comment. 
we hear a lot about co-production. This is beyond co-production, right? Co-production is just what you end up with. It should be an output of the partnerships that co-create a sustainable future. So we're reducing co-production to, hey, give me a data, we'll write a paper together, when it is actually about creating a, a future. You've heard a lot of great stuff. I want to mention something. There's the issues of data and measurement. What do we know? How well do we know it? Water use, surface, groundwater. As an atmospheric scientist, I could tell you, wet does not get wetter and dry does not get drier into the future. We don't know where the circulation is going to put those features. So there's a high degree of uncertainty. There's the valuation for whom and what are their notions for, of benefit. Decision-making, where are the trade-offs? And the issue of governance as being structural networks and partnerships and processes, who is to do it and how are they supported while doing this? Adaptation is not receiving enough support and water is only receiving 3% of any climate support. But I can tell you, and everybody in this room can tell you empirically, that any climate resilience effort will fail without an emphasis on water security. So please thank the panel. <laughs>